Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. It's episode four, and today we're going to sort out why there's a train track running through a bookstore. Or is it a bookstore running through a train track? Either way, we'll sort it all out and delve into this shop's claim to fame after this quick sponsor break. And this week's sponsor is none other than you. That's right. If you like what you're hearing, you can show your appreciation by buying the book owl a cup of coffee. I know birds probably shouldn't have caffeine, but if you don't tell the vet, neither will I. So if you're able to lend the show a little support, just head over to thebookowlpodcast.com slash support and just click on the owl who's cuddled up with a cup of coffee. Speaking of a cuppa, get your tea bag steeping because we're heading off to jolly old England to go book shopping. In a train station. Alright, so what in the world am I talking about? How can you have noisy things like trains running through a peaceful place like a bookstore? Well, let me introduce you to Barter Books of Alnick, England, where trains and books collide. Uh, well, not literally, of course. I mean, it would be really bad for business if customers were having to dodge the Hogwarts Express while they were trying to browse for Harry Potter books, right? So for those of you not up on your British geography, Alnick is a small town in northern England. And for hundreds of years, despite, the t- um, despite Alnick's small size, it really was an important market town for the region. In about the 1800s, a little thing we called the Industrial Revolution barreled its way through England, and a huge importance began being placed on making sure people and stuff could be moved around efficiently. Since cars hadn't been invented yet and horses couldn't haul large enough loads with any amount of speed, around the 1830s, 1840s, Parliament said, let's get these goods chugging along, old chap, and approved the construction of thousands of miles of rail lines, And by thousands, I mean over 8,000 miles of track began networking across the country. And don't worry, I know we've got a little, shall I say, off track here, but this hasn't turned into the Train Owl podcast, and this really does have something to do with bookstores. Okay, so let's get back to the choo-choos for a moment. So eventually, one of the newly built rail lines was extended out to Alnick. And that really shouldn't be any surprise, since this was such an important market town. But what might have been a surprise to the locals came in 1887, when Alnick got itself a huge and ornately decorated station designed by William Bell. And the station was constructed of metal and glass, with loads of decorative ironwork touches in the traditional Victorian style. So, like I said, Alnick is a small town, you know, comparatively speaking. And I'm not exaggerating when I said they got a huge train station. The thing was 32,000 square feet. Compared to other towns of a similar size, that was enormous. So why did the train station need to be so big? Well, Alnick just happened to have a castle where the Duke of Northumberland spent, you know, a fair bit of time. But the Duke wasn't up in the northern England skulking around like some big old broody Bronte character. He liked to entertain. And when you've got other nobles, and possibly royalty, popping by for a holiday weekend, you do not want them showing up in some little rat trap of a station. You want to impress them from the get-go. And Alnick Station was designed to impress. And also to have plenty of space to accommodate all the many servants, baggage, and other entourage that would accompany a royal traveler. Now, we're going to skip ahead a little while, and in the 1960s, finances really needed trimming, and several of England's smaller rail lines ended up being shut down. Unfortunately, Alnick's big, beautiful station didn't save it from the chopping block, and in 1968, the last train left the station. So at some point, the station made its way into the hands of Stuart Manley, who then turned the, you know, such a big, broad space, he said, hey, let's turn it into a manufacturing plant. So Stuart's going along doing his manufacturing thing, and things are going well. And in 1991, Stuart's wife, Mary, 
who I'm going to guess is a big book nerd, wanted to open up a bookshop. And Stuart, being an accommodating kind of guy, said, well, go ahead and use the front of the building for your venture. And I know, that was the worst Northumberland accent, but come on, we're just having fun here, right? Anyway, so Mary claimed the front of the store as her own, or the front of the plant, I'm sorry, and she jumped into action, filled some shelves, and soon opened the doors to a little shop she called Barter Books. So why was it called Barter Books? Well, because you could bring in your old books, get yourself some store credit, and then take home some new books. The scheme proved really popular, and what started out as just a few shelves in the front of the manufacturing plant grew and expanded and eventually filled the entire station. The shop became crazy, crazy popular and has been written up in numerous n newspapers and on TV shows and etc, etc. And it's even been referred to as the British Library of Secondhand Bookshops. Of course, these days, while most visitors end up paying cash for their books, the practice of bartering still continues, which, since that's the principle they started on, is pretty cool that they're still doing that. Okay, so what in the world does this have to do with trains other than being opened in a closed-down train station? Well, the Manleys decided that since they owed the building's existence to trains, they should start their own train line. And they started that train line smack dab in the middle of their bookstore. Which means today when you step in, well, not today because of travel restrictions, but if you were able to go today, as you wandered the shelves, if you managed to pull your eyes up from all the tempting tomes, you'd see a model train running throughout the bookstore. And this isn't just a little loop like you might have had as a kid. This thing chugs along elaborate bridges that connect the tops of most of the standing shelves within the shop. And, okay, so I love bookshops. No surprise there, right? And whenever I travel, I'm usually mapping out all the bookstores near the areas I'll be visiting. This ends up when I'm packing to go home, I have been known to have trouble fitting my clothes back into my suitcase because I filled that suitcase with so many books. And apparently I'm not the only one with this quirk because Barter Books has become a huge tourist draw. But it's not just the books or the unique setting or the model train luring people in. The Manleys have turned this place into, um, you know, just an artist kind of mecca. And they commission artists to add to the shop's charm and to really bring home the theme of books and writing. And... One of the projects they commissioned is The Writer's Mural by Peter Dodd. And I'll be sure to include a picture of this as one of the newsletter bonuses this time around. And I'll also have a link in the show notes to where you can go see the mural. But if you can picture right now in your head a mural featuring 33 authors from Charlotte Bronte to Salman Rushdie, Jane Austen to Oscar Wilde, and... All the authors are just kind of hanging out together. And then also imagine as kind of a cute little touch, the artist also added in different pets that these writers were known to keep. Okay, so now that you've got authors and pets floating around in your head, imagine them set against a backdrop of soaring bookshelves and then some of the authors are standing on a balcony while others are below looking over a railing. And then... These aren't just tiny portraits, they are all painted life-size, which starts to give you an idea of the scale and complexity of this mural. And it took, um, how long did it take? About two years to do. It started, work started on it in September of 1999, and it, you know, the final brushstroke wasn't added until October 2001. In the end, the thing ended up being 40 foot across and 17 feet high. So yeah, it's big and complex and well worth a look if you just follow the link in the show notes or if you happen to be able to get to the bookstore yourself. There is one more claim to fame for Barter Books. And when I found this out, I couldn't believe the luck of the Manleys. See, secondhand bookshops can't rely on people bringing in books to keep their shelves stocked. It just, you know, they would just run out of books. So how do secondhand booksellers get new or, well, 
old, new material for their shops. Well, they go to book swaps and book auctions, and the Manleys were no different. And one day in the year 2000, they had spent a pretty good day of buying some new stock at a book auction, and they come home and they begin sifting through their purchases, and they find a poster. And the poster really catches their eye. It's this striking red color, and when they slip it out, they see at the top a little crown and big white letters centered on the background. So what did the words say? Well, they said, keep calm and carry on. Now, even if you know nothing of English history, you're probably familiar with this sign because it's become insanely popular and also the source for gobs of knockoffs like keep calm and eat a cookie, which is excellent advice, by the way. But the original phrase was actually a slogan from 1939 when the Second World War was going on, and the British were really having to maintain that stiff upper lip not to just break down in sheer terror as the Germans were bombing the daylights out of them. When the Manleys saw this poster, you know, it, it wasn't anything popular at that time. They just kind of liked what it said, and they liked the design. So they popped it in a frame and hung it in the shop. And all I can say is that the Manleys must have the Midas touch when it comes to selling without trying, because no sooner than they put up the poster, people were coming in and asking for copies. So from that bargain bin discovery and from people seeing it and wanting a copy, the popularity of the sign's simple design and the slogan just went skyrocketing. And as a little side note, for many years after the Manleys made this find, it was thought their poster and maybe one other were the only ones left out of the over two million that were printed during the war. But in 2012, another 15 were found, and a few others have cropped up since then. But still, the Manleys get credit for starting the Keep Calm craze. Anyway, that's about it for Barter Books. Um, in addition to the Choo Choo Train and the Keep Calm poster and, you know, shelf after shelf of books, the shop also seems like a really cool place to hang out. It's got dozens of pieces of art from, you know, famous and local artists. And it's got a nice little cafe where you can get coffee or tea or even lunch if you'd like. Um, yeah, actually, I'd kind of like to be there right now. Anyway, thanks for listening, everyone. I've got a little personal update coming up, but I just wanted to let you know that I really do appreciate you taking the time from your day to listen to my tales. And if you haven't already, I would love it if you would subscribe to the show via your favorite podcast app, podchaser.com, or at the bookowlpodcast.com slash subscribe. And if you want to get more out of every episode, you can join the flock by signing up for the newsletter at thebookoutpodcast.com slash contact. And as ever, any links mentioned are in the show notes. All right. Cheers, everyone. And I will hoot at you next time. Okay. As for my personal update, last week was release day for my book, The Return of Odysseus. Um, this is the final book in my historical fantasy series. And I have to say, after six years since the start of this project, it's really strange to be done with it. Um, I won't go into the whole story of where the series began and the stumbling blocks I had along the way, but if you are interested in that, um, I did get a little bit nostalgic on my writing blog last week, and I've got a link to that post in the show notes. Anyway, so what is this book about? Well, as the tagline says... The war may be over, but the fight for Osteria's future has just begun. Dun, dun, dun. So dramatic, right? And here's the book's description. With the immortality of the gods resting in the hands of the Titans, all of Osteria is at risk of annihilation. As their powers fail and their allies fall, the gods must put their trust in the unlikeliest of heroes, in the unlikeliest of places. As the weakened gods limp their way toward a final battle against the Titans, one man simply wants to return home from the war in Deimos. But getting home may just be the toughest challenge Odysseus has ever endured. 
Captured by a vengeful foe who makes the brutality of war seem like child's play, Odysseus faces torture, indignity, and despair. His only hope proves to be a cunning sorceress, but even she has tricks that keep Odysseus's goals impossibly out of reach. With Odysseus's world about to fall apart, with Osteria teetering on the edge of ruin, and with the Titans on the verge of supremacy, can the gods band together and intervene before it's too late? For both gods and mortals, it's a race against time for survival, for love, and for Osteria in this emotionally charged final installment of the Osteria Chronicles. So if that little teaser has left you interested in the book, you can find it on most retailers. And if you haven't started the series yet, book one is always free on those same retailers. Any links you need, again, as always, are in the show notes. Okay, that's it for me, and have a great couple weeks. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod. <laughs>